Hi, this is Lisa with Coping With Yarn, and today I found out that E.T., the extraterrestrial, in his adventure on Earth, um, which is a novel by William Coatswinkle, is on the public domain. So I'm so excited for that. So this is the book that we'll be starting out with. And then... This book is also on there, which is E.T., The Green Planet, the, the book of the green planet. And so that's when E.T. goes home, <laughs> which is also um, William Coatswinkle also wrote that as well. Okay, so I've had these books forever. I don't even remember where I got them from. I know I've had the first CT book since sixth grade for sure, but I don't even know. So here we go. And my apologies if I start giggling or laughing. <laughs> okay, chapter one. The spaceship floated gently, anchored by a beam of lavender light to the earth below. Were someone to come upon this landing site, they might, for a moment, think that a gigantic old Christmas tree ornament had fallen from the night sky, for the ship was round, reflective, and inscribed with a delicate Gothic design. Its mellow radiance, the scattering of something like diamond dust on its hull, would make one look again for the ornamental hook at its point, by which it had hung in a far-off galaxy." But there was no one nearby, and the ship had landed purposefully, the intelligence commanding it beyond navigational error. Yet, an error was about to be made. E.T., you naughty thing. The hatch was open, the crew out and about, pro probing the earth with strangely shaped tools, like little old elves caring for their misty, moonlit gardens, when here and there the mist parted and the pastel light from the ship's hull fell upon them, it was clear they were elves, but creatures more scientifically minded, for they were taking samples of flowers, moss, shrubs, saplings, yet their misshapen heads, their drooping arms, and roly-poly sawed-off torsos would make one think of elf land, and the tenderness they showed the plants might add to this impression were someone of Earth nearby to observe it, but no one was, and the elfin botanists from space were free to work in peace. Even so, they started in fear when a bat twittered by, or an owl hooted, or a dog barked in the distance. Then their breathing quickened, <laughs> and a mist-like camouflage surrounded them, flowing from their fingertips and from their long toes. Then they would be... Oh, I didn't, I didn't know the... The mist came from their fingertips and toes. That's interesting. Then they would be hard indeed to discover. Then a solitary walker in the moonlit in the moonlight might pass by the misty patch, never knowing a crew from ancient space huddled there. The spaceship was another matter. Enormous Victorian Christmas tree ornaments don't fall to the earth with great frequency. Their presence is felt by radar by military intuition, by other scanning devices, and this gigantic bauble had been detected. It was too big to be missed. No protective fog could completely cover it on Earth or swinging in the tree of night. So an encounter is at hand. Government vehicles are out, and government specialists are earning their night's pay, bouncing around the back roads, talking to each other on radios, closing in on the great ornament. However, the little old crew of botanists are not really disturbed. Not yet, in any case. They know they have time. They know to within the most subdu subdivided increments of time how long it will be before the gruff, clumsy noises of earthling vehicles sound in their ears. They have been here before, for the earth is large and there are many plants to pick. If one, w if one wishes... To have a complete collection. The continued 
They continued their sampling, mist flowing about each of them as he walked back with his prize from the earth soil. Up the hatchway they went and into the lovely ornament's interior pastel glow. They moved unconcernedly through its pulsing corridors of technological wonders and into the central wonder of the ship, a gigantic inner cathedral of earth's foliage. This immense greenhouse was the core of the ship, its purpose, its specialty. Here were lotus flowers from a Hindu lagoon, ferns from the floor of Africa, tiny berries from Tibet, blackberry bushes from a backcountry American road. Here, in fact, was one of everything on earth, or nearly everything, for the job was not yet done. Everything flourished. Were an expert from one of Earth's great bot botanical gardens to come into this greenhouse, he would find plants he had never seen before, except in fossil form, imprinted in coal. His eyes would certainly pop to find alive plants the dinosaurs had dined on. Plants from Earth's first gardens, incalculable, incalculable ages ago. He would faint and revived with herbs from the hanging gardens of, of Babylon. From the fanning roof line, moisture drip it, dripped with nutrients that nourished the countless species that embellished every surface of the ship's core. The most perfect collections of vegetation on earth, old as the earth is old, old as the little botanists themselves, who come and go, and the crinkling lines of the corners of their eyes have a look of fossils too, itched over immense ages of gathering. One of them entered now, carrying a local herb, its leaves already drooping. He took it to a basin and, and placed it in a liquid that affected its disposition at once, leaves suddenly reviving, roots waving at the same moment from a rosette window from the above the basin. A pastel light came on, bathing the plant and causing it to stand up straight again beside its neighbor, a little flower of antiluvian make. The extraterrestrial botanist gazed at it for a moment to see that all was well, then turned and recrossed the greenhouse. He moved beneath Japanese cherry blossoms, hanging Amazon flowers, and some ordinary horseradish that leaned his way lovingly. He patted it and walked on, <laughs> back through the pulsating corridor and down the glowing hatchway. Out in the night air, his body exhaled faint mist again, which surrounded him as he walked along to gather more plants. A colleague passed him holding a wild parsnip root. Their eyes did not meet, but something else took place. Their chest glowed simultaneously in inner red glow from their heart region, suffusing their thin, translucent skin. Then they passed, the one with his parsnip and the other empty-handed, down a rocky incline. His heart light dark once more. Mist shrouded, he entered tall grass, tall as his own head, and came out the other side at the edge of Redwood Forest. Ah! Okay, that's kind of creepy because we're only, like, a couple hours away from the Redwood Forest, and I could totally see E.T. picking a fern. There, dwarfed by the enormous trees, he turned back toward the ship, and his heart lit, heart light glowed again, as if he were signing to the ship itself to the beloved old ornament he'd been riding in for ages. On its catwalks, in its hatchway, other heart lights glowed, like fireflies moving here and there, satisfied that his protection was near, and knowing that there was still time to work before danger came. He entered the redwood forest. Nighthawks sang, inse insects creaked in the shadows, and he walked on through his naturally distended stomach, skimmed the surface of the forest floor. <clears throat> Hoglo <laughs> Hoglobulinish, though it was actually a perfectly suitable arrangement, giving him a low and stable center of, gra of gravity. However, it was not a form that Earth folks could readily take to. These large webbed feet coming almost directly out of a low hanging belly and long hands trailing ape fashion besides it for this reason. He and his colleagues were million years shy and never had the inclination to make contact with anything other than the plant life of Earth. A failing, perhaps, but they had monitored things long enough to know that Earthmen 
that to Earthmen, their beautiful ship was, first of all, a target, and they themselves material for a taxidermist to display under glass. So the extraterrestrial moved cautiously, quietly through the forest, eyes searching around, bulbous eyes, enormously <laughs> convex, the kind you might find on a giant frog hopping along. He knew what chance such a frog would have for survival on a city street, that he hated his own about the same. Oh, he rated his own about the same. As for giving instruction to humanity at some seat of international government, it was out of the question. When your nose was like a, a bashed-in Brussels sprout, <laughs> and your overall appearance was like that of an overgrown prickly pear, he waddled along in perfect stealth, knuckles brushing the leaves, let, let some other visitors from space of more familiar form be humanity's teachers. His only interest was a little redwood sapling he had had his protruding eye on for some time up ahead. He stopped beside it, examined it carefully, and then dug it out, murmuring to it in his, gra in his gravelly space tongue, <sighs> words of weird, unearthly shape, but the redwood seemed to understand that the shock to its root system was neutralized as it lay in his great creased palm. He turned and a faint light reached his eye, light that attracted him from the little suburb in the valley beyond the trees. He'd been curious about it for some time, and tonight would be the last night he could investigate. For tonight, a phase of investigation ended. His ship would leave Earth behind for an extended period, until the next great mutation in earth vegetation, a period to be marked by centuries. Tonight would be the last chance he would have to peek in the windows. <laughs> he crept... Okay, so I'm reading this with my daughter Hannah. <laughs> he crept out of the stand of redwoods and lowered himself to the edge of a fire road cut through the hillside. The sea of yellow house lights glowed tantalizingly. He crossed the fire road, stomach dragging through the low brush on the long voyage back through space. He had had something to offer his shipmates, the tale of the little adventure into the lights, a lone prickly pear on the human road, the ancient crinkle lines at his eyes smiled. He tiptoed down the edge of the fire road on great webbed feet with great long toes. Earth wasn't perfect for his form. He had been wrought on a planet that made sense out of feet like this. He had come from, things were more fluid, and you could sort of paddle along. And only infrequent. So is he a duck? No, he's not a duck. He's a frog. <laughs> and only infrequently have to waddle on solid ground. The house lights flickered below, and for a moment his own heart light answered, glowing ruby red. He loved Earth, especially its plant life, but he liked humanity too. And as always, when his heart lit light glowed, he wanted to teach them, guide them, give them the stored intelligence of millennia. His shadow shuffled before him in the moonlight, head shaped like an eggplant on a long stalk of a neck. And for his ears, they were hidden in the folds of his head, like the first shy shoots of baby lima beans. No earth would have, to, would have too good a laugh were he to walk up its aisle of world government. Not all the stored intelligence in the universe was enough when people were laughing at your parish silhouette. He kept it hidden in the moonlight, with faint mist attending it, and proceeded on down the road. Inside his head, he received the warning signal from the ship, but knew it was premature. Knew it was to give the more clumsy... Um, you're about done, honey. But how much more minutes? Two done. more. I'm recording, babe. By any standard of speed on Earth, of course, he was impossibly slow. An Earth child could move three times as fast. One had almost run him down with a bicycle one terrible night. Close. Close. Very close. But not tonight. Tonight, he'd be careful. He stopped and listened. And the ship's warning signal came on again, thumping in his heart light. The code of alarm... The instrument fluttered lightly, calling for a roundup of all crew members. Second preliminary message. But there was time enough for the swift, 
He waddled left, right, left, knuckles fairly swimming in the leaves as he dragged along toward the edge of the town. He was old, but he moved, but he moved well, faster than most ten million year botanists with feet like marsh ducks. His great orbicular eyes rolled, scanning the town and the sky and the tree and the ground immediately ahead. No one was coming from any direction, only himself, coming in for one quick look at the at an earthling, and then goodbye for several rounds in the beloved ship, far from here. His orbiting gaze jumped suddenly forward down the fire road, where a shaft of moving light appeared, followed by another, twin lights racing toward him out of nowhere. Simultaneously, his heart alarm went into a panic stage. All crew, return! Danger! 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 He stumbled backward and then sideways, disoriented by the advancing light, which was much faster than a bicycle, much louder, much more aggressive. The light was blinding now, harsh earth light, cold and clear. He stumbled again and fell off the fire road into the brush, light streaking between him and his ship, light cutting him off from the redwood forest and the clearing beyond it. And when the great ornament hovered, waiting... Danger, 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 Will Robinson. Just kidding. His heart light flashed wildly. He reached for the little redwood sapling that had fallen on the road and its roots crying out to him. His long fingers advanced and drew back in a blur as a blinding light struck and then roaring engines. He rolled in the brush, frantically covering his heart light with a loose branch. Yeah, that'll cover it. His great eyes snapped taking in detail on all sides, but none more horrible than the sight of the little redwood sapling crushed by the vehicles. Young leaves mangled, its consciousness still crying out to him, Danger! 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 Light and more light followed on the fire road, a road that had always been empty, but now echoed with the sound of vehicles and human voices, shouting, raging, intent on capture. He struggled through the brush, fluttering heart light still hidden by the hand, while the cold light sought for him, sweeping the brush. All the star intelligence and seven galaxies could not help him move faster in the foreign element. His duckish toes, how absurdly useless they were. He felt the swiftness of human feet upon their own ground, advancing all around him, and knew what a fool he had been to tempt them. The quick thumping sound sounded, and cold streaks of light cut the brush over and over. Their alien tongues bellowed, and one of their n- and one of their number, which much jingling at his wrist, was on the scent. In the flashing light, the old botanist saw the man's belt with something hanging from it, like an assembly of teeth, jagged, edged in trophies, possibly wrenched from the mouth of some other unfortunate space creature and placed on a ring. It's just a keychain, E.T. It's okay. Time, 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 called the ship, rounding up its last straggling members. He lunged under the surging lights so the edge of the fire ro- to the edge of the fire road. The vehicles were scattered, as were the drivers. He turned on his protective mist and glided across the road in the moonlight, blending with the foul exhaust from their engines, the noxious cloud momentarily adding to his camouflage. And then he was across the road and sliding down a low ravine. Just as quickly their cold lights turned, as it seemingly where he crossed, he huddled against the sand and rock. As the earthman leapt across the ravine, his orbiting eyes raced upward, and he saw the horrible ring of jingling teeth, grinning hideously as its owners leapt over him. He crouched deeper into the rock, mist around him, no different from the other little patches of fog one sees in ravines, by night where the moisture clings. Yes, I'm just a cloud. Earthlings, one of your own, insignificant. Don't probe it with your lights, for there's a great long neck inside it and two webbed feet with toes as long and spindly as the roots of a purplish toad shade plant. You wouldn't understand, I'm sure, that I'm on your planet to save your foliage before you completely annihilate, annihilate it. The others jumped over him, dark voices excited, enjoying the hunt and well-armed. He scampered up after the last one and passed and entered the forest behind them. His only advantage was his knowledge of the beloved terrain from which he'd been gathering. 
His eyes revolved quickly, locating the trail, a faint indentation in the gathering of branches that, ne that nettled the darkness, a path he and his crewmates had made while bearing the seedlings away. The rough, ungraciousness light stabbed the dark, shining at different angles. The earthmen were confused now, and he was navigating directly along back to the ship. His heart light grew brighter, and the energy field of his group strengthening it as he neared them, all their hearts calling to him as well as a hundred million years of plant life on board, calling danger, danger, danger. He rushed between the sweeping lights along the single clear path in the forest, his long toe roots feeling each impression with exquisite sensitivity. Each tangle of leaves, each spider web was known to him. He felt their gentle messages, speeding him through the forest, saying, This way! This way! He followed, fingers trailing the soft floor, long roots dragging, wiggling, receiving signals from the forest, while his heart light blazed, eager to merge with those hearts in the clearing where the, where the great ship waited. He was ahead of the cold light now, its beams entangled in branches that had emitted him. But which denied his pursuers? Branches sprang out, locked together, and blocked their passage. A low root lifted slightly, tripping the fellow with a ring of teeth, and another root trapped the foot of, the, of his subordinate, who fell face flat on the ground, cursing in the tongue of the planet, while the plants cried, Run! 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 The extraterrestrial ran through the forest to the clearing. The grand ornament, jewel of the galaxy, waited for him. He waddled toward it, toward its serene and beautiful light, light of ten million lights. Its wondrous powers were all converging now, emitting supreme waves of radiance that reflected all around. He pushed along through the grass, trying to become visible to the ship, to put his heart light in touch, but his long, ridiculous toes were entangled in some weeds that wouldn't let go. Stay, they said. <laughs> Stay with us. He, he yanked loose and pushed forward into the outermost aura of ship light. Just at the edge of the grass, the radiant ornament shone through the stalks all around him, casting its glorious rainbow. He spied the latch, still open, and a crewmate standing in it, heart light flashing, calling to him, desperately searching. I'm coming! I'm coming! He shuffled through the grass, but his hanging stomach, shaped by other degrees of gravity, slowed him, and a sudden group decision flooded him, a feeling that swept through his very bones. The hatch closed, petals folding inward, and the ship lifted off as he burst from the grass, waving his long-fingered hand. But the ship couldn't see him now. Its enormous power thrust was being employed, blinding light, obliterating all detail in the landscape. It hovered momentarily, then departed. Spinning above the treetops, the lovely ornament returning to the outermost branches of the night. The creature stood in the grass, his heart light flashing with fear. He was alone, three million light years from home. So I'll read the next chapter, either tomorrow or the upcoming days. Okay, good night, everybody. <laughs>